can be very distressing and depressing. We've endured through a pandemic which is not yet over and yet have become more divided as a people because what should have been a healthcare crisis has not only become that, but it has become a political crisis. We see the devastation that comes when governments fall, like what happened recently in Afghanistan. We see the rising cost of living here in Toronto which is leading to more and more poverty. We see man treating his fellow man poorly as crime rates have been on the rise. And for the Christian, if we're not careful, we can come to think that God has lost control of this universe. He is not. For the Christian, though, even though we will have to deal with the problems of this world, our goal should not be to become so entangled in them that we keep our eyes off of Christ. Because in spite of it all, we can still be happy, even in this world of pain and woe. You would turn in your songbook to song number 587. That will be the topic of this morning's lesson. Every quarter we take one Sunday to examine one of the psalms is found in our psalm books because we are taught in Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3 that when we sing, we teach one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So if we're going to teach one another, we better know what we're teaching. And so the song is titled, Sing and Be Happy. Verse 1 says, If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem great all the whole day through, there's a silver lining that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see it, my friend. Trust in his promises grand. Verse 2 says, Often we are troubled and tired, sick with sorrow and pain. There are others living in sin, blessed with earthly gain. Take a courage we cannot tell what the morrow may bring. When the dark clouds vanish away, then your heart truly can sing. Verse 3 says, Oft we fail to see the rainbow up in heaven's fair sky, when it seems the fortunes of earth frown and pass us by. There are things we know that are worth more than silver and gold. If we tr hope and trust him each day, we shall have pleasures untold. The refrain, which is sung in two parts, the main melody there says, Sing and you'll be happy today. Press along to the goal. Trust in him who leadeth the way. He is keeping your soul. Let the world know where you belong. Look to Jesus and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. That's the part of the two parts I will be leading. I normally don't lead that part, but we have our singers spread out through this room. And so if I choose not to lead the main, the, the, even though that's not the top part of the song, the, the, if I choose not to lead the alto part of the song, I'm afraid the song will fall apart when we get to the refrain. And so Gord can lead the other part. If you, I guess Gord usually sings that other part. And so uh, I will sing the main, the main alto part in, when it comes to the refrain. The song itself was written in 1940 by a man named Emery S. Peck. He was born on January 19, 1893, and died on October 9, 1975. Unlike some of the other songs that, we have, that we've examined, and the, the person was a preacher, or as a denomination might call a pastor, or some religious leader, this man was not. This man was a music teacher and a band director at Grinnell College in Gainesville, Georgia. And for people who don't know where Gainesville, Georgia, I had to look it up too. 
That's about 100 kilometers or 60 miles northeast of Atlanta, uh, where we will know, hopefully, where the city of Atlanta is in Georgia. That's all I could find on him on the internet. He was not really a famous man. He was not really known for earthly accomplishments, except for this song. But this song that he wrote lives on in our hymnals almost 50 years after his death and almost 80 years after it was written. So knowing that, what does this song teach us? Well, first of all, the song isn't going to sugarcoat you. It's not denying human struggles. Verse 1 largely talks about being depressed and burdened. Verse 2 talks about being tired and grief-stricken, feeling that life is unfair. And verse 3 talks about being forgotten. Now, you can think about that in the context of 1940. What was going on in 1940? Well, the world has had the Great Depression in the 30s, and people were still struggling to get out of that. And of course, we had this little matter of World War II uh, going on in Europe, and uh, Europe at war with that, and the United States and Canada being dragged into that war. And so it's very easy when you place it in context to know why this song might resonate to the people who were worshiping God at that time. Because all of these things, all of these feelings listed in this song are feelings that at some point in our lives we've most very likely felt. We are tempted by the devil to look out into the world and see all the earthly blessings that God has supposedly given to evil people while leaving the children of God poor and many times shut out of these blessings. And he says, is it really fair? The devil might say, that's the temptation. Is it really fair that God blesses evil people and he doesn't bless you? Or perhaps it's similar to the temptation that Jesus uh, faced from the devil. If you only worship me, then you will obtain these things. For God seemingly blesses the wicked over the righteous. That's the devil's temptations. That's what we face when we uh, look out at the world. We could say it doesn't, just doesn't seem fair. But what we do need to remember is that, yes, God blesses all men, whether we're young or old, whether we're Christians or not. Physically, God blesses us in ways that we may not be able to see. But for the Christian, we need to remember that God has not promised the Christian of a life that would be perfect and free of pain. For one thing, we learn from Scripture, Christ suffered while he was here on this earth. In 1 Peter chapter 2, in verses 20 to 23, there Peter writes, For what credit is it if, when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was the seed found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. Jesus suffered greatly while here on this earth, yet he didn't commit sin even through all of that. He didn't revile his enemies. When he was reviled, he didn't threaten people when he suffered. He could have said, you, you cause suffering for me. You wait, just you wait, and I'm going to get even with you. That's the attitude that you might have. Looking out, well, people did me wrong. I'm going to look out for the first mistake that they make, and then I'm going to pounce, and I'm going to get even. Christ didn't do that. Christ suffered many things. But he left us an example to follow according to verse 21. Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow. We don't all desire to, be, to suffer. But Peter says here, don't suffer for wrong. If you suffer for wrong, you deserve that. 
Don't, don't, don't think that that's great. I did wrong and I'm suffering and therefore God was with me. No, that's not what we need to take out of suffering. But if we are suffering because of our faith in Christ, we can endure through that. The endurance through suffering is commendable to God. And Christ gave us that example. And so if Christ suffered for us, who do we think, or why do we think, that we are any better than Christ? Or any more deserving to suffer less? In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, there Peter wrote, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. Christians suffer because we call this world to come to repentance, to obey God and resist the devil, and to live a moral life. That's the message of the cross. Repent and turn to God. What happens when someone is threatened? or feels threatened? What does an animal do when it feels like it's trapped? It will attack. Even the most timid of animal will find a way to attack if it thinks it's cornered. A skunk will not usually spray if it has a way out. But if it thinks it has no way out, you better watch because you're about to get sprayed. Any animal generally does that. Well, humans, not animals, but humans act the same way. When someone threatens us in our way of life, what do we do? We try to fight back. We try to protect what we have. We try to alleviate the suffering. I'm not saying that Protecting our loved ones or, or other things is necessarily wrong. But we better expect that when we're Christians, we're going to face persecution. That we're going to suffer. That, and this song doesn't deny that. The song doesn't try to say, well, you just need to pretend your struggles don't exist. You're a Christian, now just pretend. Or just think that they don't exist. The song doesn't deny that. And neither should we, because we do have struggles in this world. The song also doesn't pretend that our struggles, as I just said, simply don't exist. Instead, it tells us where to place our trust in order to find joy. In 1 Peter chapter 2, we're going to go back, and we're going to read verse 20 to 23 again. But if you were following along, you'll notice I left out part of verse 23. This time, we will get it all. 1 Peter 2, beginning verse 20. For what credit is it if, when you are beaten for your fault, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving to us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Jesus suffered, yes. That's the example we should follow. We can endure through suffering, but there's also another part of that example. We need to commit ourselves to God, just like Jesus did, because we know that God judges righteously. When we judge, how do we judge? Well, oftentimes we judge according to appearances. We judge based on one side of the story. That's why it's always good when we are asked to judge something that we get both sides of the story. Because we are often, when we tell stories, especially if it concerns us, we will minimize the things that put us in a bad light. And we will maximize the things that put others in a bad light. And then we're going to ask, them, well, if that's the situation, what should I do? Or what should be the proper reaction? 
If we've not heard both sides of the story, we should not judge. Because we know we are fallible. We know that people embellish. And we know that we can make wrong judgments. Those are earthly judgments. God's judgments are different. Now, Jesus could have judged perfectly because he's God. He could have done so while on this earth. But when he was here, in the book of John especially, Jesus made clear that he left heaven. And there was a goal that he had here on this earth. His goal was to reveal the Father to the world by preaching the gospel of salvation. He did not come at that time, according to John 12, to judge the world. He came to, came to John, it came to the world to save the world. Judgment, final judgment anyway, will come later. He will judge. He will judge. And God will judge. God judges righteously because God knows all. So we should follow the example of Christ. Of course, this doesn't mean that we try to go out and not convince people of sin. That is a form of judgment. But we do not do so of our own authority. We do not come along and say, I judge you, or this is my judgment. If it's a judgment based on scripture, it is God's judgment. Even the Archangel Michael in the book of Jude wouldn't condemn the devil. He says, the Lord rebuke you. But ultimately, we leave the final judgment to God and trust in the one who is leading the way. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, in verses 6 to 11, there we read, If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which, we, which you have carefully followed. But reject profane and old, and old wise fables and exercise yourself towards godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having pr promise of the life that is now, sorry, that now is, and the one that, which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, or in all acceptance. For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach. Because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe, these things command and teach. It can sometimes be hard to let go of trusting in ourselves and placing tr our trust in another. This can be difficult in doing so with people we've seen and met. Now tell someone to do so with God when we have not seen with our own two eyes. That requires faith. That requires faith not only that God exists, but that God can be believed to fulfill the promises that he has promised. Hebrews chapter 11 is full of men who in faith believed the promises of God. Abraham was told to leave his father's house and go to a country that is not theirs. You think about that society at time at that time. We, live, we might not take a look at that and say, well, we, we leave our parents' house when we turn 18, turn 20, now might be 30. Uh, 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 what's the big deal? Everything in that society had to do with your family unit and your, just your extended family. Your wealth, your name, your reputation came from your family. Abraham was told to give it up. Leave your father's house. Leave your name behind. Leave all of the reputation that you have. Go to a land that I will show you. I will make a great nation out of you. Not out of your father. Out of you. And, in, and by you, by your seed, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Abraham believed God, even though he never saw the fulfillment of that promise. He knew that God would do it. We need to have faith and put our trust in God. But let's not come away thinking that the unjust 
are simply being blessed now and will always receive blessings. Because that doesn't happen even here on this earth. But let's also not think that they won't receive punishment later for disobedience. In Psalms 37, Psalms 37, beginning at verse 1, there we read, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in the way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. We can grow impatient with God, thinking that the wicked will never be punished. But they will in God's time. We need to trust in God's promises because in truth, it is those that wait on the Lord, the meek, who will inherit the earth. That should sound familiar because it's one of the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. But when it says the meek shall inherit the earth, it means that the meek will be the ones who truly enjoy the earth's blessings because they will be content with what they have. The world seeks more. Christians should learn to be content. Third thing this song teaches us is that sometimes when Christians get so down, we fail to see what God has done for us. First of all, Matthew 6 would teach that God is the provider of our needs. In Matthew 6, verses 25 to 32, there Jesus said, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you shall put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more of, of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. God is the provider for our needs. He provides for our daily bread. He provides for our clothing. He provides for everything that we truly need. Now, we may not get everything we want. God's not the provider for all our wants. But he is the provider for all our needs. We just need to put our faith and trust in him. But God is also the provider of many other blessings. Blessings that we need to take very seriously and think of as precious. In Ephesians chapter 1, and in verse 3, there Paul wrote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. We read that from time to time, and we say, yes, God blesses us with spiritual blessings. And then we move on from that without ever considering what are those blessings. Well, in Psalms 32, verses 1 and 2, there the psalmist says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and whose spirit there is no deceit. A spiritual blessing we have in Christ is the forgiveness of our sins, and how great that forgiveness should be to us. How great we should see it. Because without it, everything else doesn't matter. We don't have the forgiveness of sins. We're going to be doomed for all of eternity. So forgiveness of sins, that's a spiritual blessing found only in Christ. 
In Titus chapter 2 and verses 11 to 14, there Paul wrote, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify himself, his own special people, zealous for good works. What do we see here? Well, God has provided us his grace, his favor. That's a spiritual blessing that we have in Christ. He has provided us a blessed hope of the glorious appearing of Christ. We have a hope in Christ. We don't have hope out of Christ. We only have hope in Christ. Hope of what? Hope of heaven. That's a spiritual blessing that's found in Christ. In James chapter 4, verses 9 to 11, there James writes, Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord. The Lord is very compassionate and merciful. What is one of the spiritual blessings found here? That we have the ability to endure through suffering. We count them blessed who endure. God provides us the ability through his word to endure through temptation, to endure through struggles, to endure through strife. God will never leave us nor forsake us. That's a promise we have in Christ. But it's only in Christ. It's only in Christ. Sometimes we can focus so much on the bad that we fail to see the good. Let's not do that. Let's look past that. And so knowing all this, this song teaches us to sing and be happy today. Singing is oftentimes seen, or sorry, seen as a happy experience. James 5.13 says, As anyone cheerful, let him sing psalms. So because of all what God has done for us, we should cheerfully lift up our voice and praise God in song, for he is deserving of such praise. Our final verse this morning will be from Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, verses 6 to 11. Here is a scene of the worship in heaven. Revelation 4, beginning at verse 6. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second creature like a calf. The third living creature had the face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. When we sing, sometimes I heard, I heard a song this week uh, where the singer was singing a song and had a very catchy tune. We're going we're gonna to forget the fact it was played with instruments. But a very catchy tune. I'm like, wow, this is an interesting tune. And you listen to the words, and the words were about him and his friend. It was a song, first of all, that really couldn't be sung outside the context of, of him specifically, because uh, it was about him and his friend. It was supposedly a praise to God. 
I heard very little praise to God in that song. I heard a lot about testimony. We hear a lot about testimony, and that's, that's a lot of what religion is today. What is your personal testimony? And when you sit back and think about that, what does personal testimony do? <laughs> it focuses the worship on us. There is nothing wrong with people knowing how we came to Christ. I met so-and-so who taught me the scriptures. I know, I know there are members in this audience who have spoken to other people. Because they spoke to other people, they became a Christian. And people say, well, if I had never met so-and-so, I might have never realized that. But it's not glory to the person. Glory be to God right. who gave us his word. That's where our singing should be aimed. We sing and be happy because of what God has done for us. Right. So if the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue, there's a silver lining that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see it, my friend. Trust in his promises grand. For the non-Christian, you can only receive these grand promises if you obey God. You cannot receive them in the world. You cannot receive them apart from Christ. You need to be happy in Christ. And the only way you can be happy is if you repent, you believe in Jesus, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ, and you baptize for the remission of your sins. If you haven't done that, why not do it today? I'm not ashamed to.